It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the option of rebound if necessary. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom to learn these important things of the Word of God. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Actually, verse 7. Genesis 3, 7. <clears throat> Genesis 3, 7. Then the eyes of them, of both of them, were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. This is man adjusting to man instead of man adjusting to God. And this is when people seek the approval of man over the approval of God. This is when people seek the approbation of man over the approbation of God. And when they made coverings for themselves, what they did is they fell right under the composite of Satan, which is self-righteousness. They became self-righteous. And in their eyes, they were doing something that was proper. For them, it would be proper, appropriate for them to cover themselves. And today, we as a people always, that is not us, but we as a people as a country, we always seem to want to look at what is appropriate for certain people especially. It is appropriate for a politician to act a certain way. Liar. It is appropriate for a minister to act a certain way. Now forget the rest of everyone else. Just certain people in certain positions. There's an appropriateness. as something that must be proper. And that's the way man looks at man. And you're not proper unless you follow man's proper protocol. Well, man came up with a proper protocol in his eyes. Cover himself with a fig leaf. Stupid. And so they went from great spiritual dynamics, that is, Adam and Eve. They went from great spiritual dynamics. They went from meeting in the cool, in the breeze of the evening. They went from meeting in the breeze of the evening every night to doing something proper. They went from functioning under God's, what God was teaching them as virtue to what is, what they considered, proper. They went from the protocol plan of God to the protocol plan of Satan. And the protocol plan of Satan does that which is proper. And that might sound a bit strange, but he masquerades as an angel of light. So what is the appropriate thing? What's the appropriate thing to wear? What's the appropriate thing to say? And that's the way people think today. And when a nation absorbs in its culture that which is appropriate over virtue and values, they lose the vigor of their culture. And the dynamics and the vigor of the unique spiritual life is what gives a culture its vigor, that is, for believers. But we are an arrogant people. We can't say certain things unless we offend someone. This is called political correctness today. And I'm not talking about just within a church. I'm talking about you can't say anything outside of a church without offending somebody. No longer can you say someone's retarded. Well, you look up retarded in the dictionary, it says a person who is slow, who has a handicap, etc. That's the meaning of it. But we can't say it anymore. Why? It's not appropriate. Political correctness. Political correctness is developed by Satan himself. Why? It squashes freedom. We are not free to say things that we could have said years ago without any worry about anything. But you say something today and you might get sued. You might get fired, etc. Why? You're not being appropriate. You're not following what is appropriate and what is proper. And that's Satan's system. Satan's system comes up with silly things like this. This political correctness... All it is is a, a prong of Satan's system. 
And if you say something to offend someone, well, what happens when a maximum number of people in a nation are standing around waiting to be offended? That means that nation has reached a peak of arrogance. When there's a maximum number of people standing around just waiting, just itching to be offended, we've reached the pinnacle of arrogance as a nation. And we have. Not only in churches, but outside of churches. Everywhere, people are standing around just waiting to be offended. Wait till that boss says this to me. If that boss says this to me, I'll show him. Just waiting to be offended. Saying things in order to be offended later. Wanting to be offended, but yet acting as if you don't. It's all part of arrogance. And we're going down as a people. We're an arrogant nation. A people who stand around and wait to be offended are arrogant. And guess who's going to end up offending us? God himself. By what? Terror. Or we'll just lose this whole thing altogether, this war. Why? Arrogance. No one is humble enough to seek God. So we're going down as a nation. Most believers don't know what the four spiritual mechanics are. Most believers don't know what 1 John 1, 9 is. Most believers know nothing. As a result, we're going down. Down, down, in a burning ring of fire. So the nation is on the skids. We are on the skids. We're full of legalism. We're full of what is appropriate. Now you in your own homes can cuss all you want. But let a pastor do it. Well, that's not appropriate. Who says? Who made that rule? You do it all the time. Who made that rule for a certain person? That which is appropriate. That which is proper. And that's all legalism. And we're full today in this culture of what is appropriate. We're full of minding other people's business. We are adjusting the naked arrogance of this country with thinking if we as long as we hold to something that's appropriate we'll be fine and that and fine and that's wrong. The only thing we need is to get with the word of God. What does the word of God say and that's it. Forget what's appropriate. There are certain things the word of God says that you might not think appropriate in our culture. Our culture would say, "Well, that's not appropriate." When Paul said, "If you think uh, you can be saved by circumcising yourself and cut your whole thing off. The, our whole culture would look at a pastor like that and say, that was the most shocking thing I've ever heard. That is not appropriate. Just think about all the teenagers who heard that. And the only reason is, it's what is appropriate for what a pastor says. But, go, but guess what? You'll let your teenagers listen to that junk on the radio. You'll let your teenagers watch the stuff on television where they cuss all the time. Nothing wrong with cussing, but they have sexual innuendo all the time, etc. Let a pastor say something as simple as that to make a point. That's not appropriate. Who says? You do, in your arrogance. Your culture does, in its arrogance. There's only one thing that will fix this nation. And that is to correct our motivation. Now pull out that little hand uh, thing I gave you. The little handout. And look at the simultaneous advance to the high ground. This one here. For you on camera, if you ever want one, you can get them along with the tapes. Look something like that. Is that a good close-up of it? No? Well, tell me when it looks good enough. That's something about how to look. Maybe like that. But the thing is, uh, one day we're going to have an overhead eventually. And then you won't have to think about it. But still, it's nice to have these for your own edification. Simultaneous advance to the high ground. And that is, first of all, you have right motivation. And what is your right motivation? Well, first of all, God loved us first. God loved us first. As a result, we can reciprocate and we can love God. God loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born son so that whosoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. That's love. And because of that, we can love God. If it weren't for that, we would be unable to. 
So it's reciprocal love. And our motivation should always be love for God. Now on the other side of this, excuse me, two-pronged advance is what it is. The first prong, reciprocal love toward God. The second prong advance is your knowledge of doctrine. The first prong is where you get your grace orientation. The second prong advance is where you get your doctrinal orientation. All of which starts with the mentorship of the Holy Spirit. You must be filled with God the Holy Spirit. That's what's appropriate. To be filled with the Spirit. And you don't know if someone's filled with the Spirit or not. Usually. So you have motivation. Moving to the high ground on one side, your motivation, love for God. On the other side, doctrine. And that's your motivation too. You are motivated by what you do know, and you're motivated by what you do not know. If you're first starting out, you're mainly motivated by what you do not know. If you've moved all the way to play Roma, you're mainly motivated by what you do know, but you're always learning until it's your time to stop learning, and God determines that time. So there's simultaneous advance to the high ground. And once you get to the high ground, you will have maximum glorification of God. But first of all, tactically, you will have a personal sense of destiny. Just look to the right side there and you'll see. Personal sense of destiny. A personal sense of destiny is composed of confidence in God and courage toward people. That courage toward people includes not caring about what is appropriate, just doing what is right. Not what is appropriate, but what is right. Appropriate doesn't necessarily mean right. What culture says is appropriate may be totally wrong. In some cultures, they, for example, in Africa, in their culture, it is appropriate. In fact, if you don't do it, you're a terrible person. You must circumcise the young little girls. And that, of course, destroys any uh, sex pleasure they will ever have in life. But it's appropriate to do that in an African culture. It's not right. So you see the difference. The difference between what is appropriate in man's thinking and what is right. And what is right? The Word of God. And this is where you reach a personal sense of destiny. Confidence in God. Courage toward people. Your strategic victory is finally occupation with Christ. What happens when you reach occupation with Christ? Apparently, people were quite, quite impressed with this, but my pastor taught this. Can't believe you never heard it before. But this is what it is. When you reach occupation with Christ, this becomes second nature to you. Flexible versus inflexible. Now, there's one place where you need to be inflexible, and that's with doctrine, the Word of God. Bible doctrine will put, because there's also doctrine of demons. Bible doctrine! You, as a believer, must be inflexible when it comes to Bible doctrine. That means it's number one, no matter what. Bible doctrine's number one. You must be inflexible about that in your thinking. Bible doctrine, number one, today, tomorrow, the next day, 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 inflexible. You're inflexible with it. And you will not put anything ahead of the Word of God. You're inflexible about that. Maybe you have set up for yourself a time to learn the Word of God. Maybe you've organized your life as such. And maybe at 7 o'clock every evening you've organized your life to where you will get the Word of God. And you become very inflexible about that. And somebody calls you and says, hey, let's go have a party. You say, no, that's my Bible class time. You're very inflexible regarding Bible doctrine. You got something to do, you work around it. You organize your life around Bible doctrine. Now, of course, there are certain cases where uh, maybe uh, the, job, the boss says, work over well, you can't tell him no or you'll get fired. So in that case, you have to be flexible enough to be to where you just, you're flexible enough to just move it up to whatever time you can, except you don't miss it. You're still inflexible. You're not going to miss that hour of doctrine. You'll just listen when you get home. 
after it's been recorded. And we have uh, such flexibility with time today, we can record something and you can listen to it six hours later. And that's all part of God's grace so that we can be inflexible when it comes to Bible doctrine. But people aren't inflexible. This is what's wrong with this country. People aren't inflexible when it comes to doctrine, but they are very inflexible when it comes to everything else, all the details of life. When it comes to money, inflexible. When it comes to uh, whatever uh, type of... When it comes to a football game, they're going and they're inflexible about it. They're not going to change that for nothing. Although we weasel out a Bible class for football. See, they're inflexible about a football game. How stupid. Now... Flexibility goes with everything else. That's the details of life. And you have to be flexible about the details of life. And most fights among Christians get started about things that are flexible. Among most Christians. Any big fight I've ever gotten into, usually, I have a sin nature, has been about an inflexible thing. You can't be flexible about doctrine. You can't be, and you can't be flexible about authority in doctrine and that God has given authority to the pastor, period, and you can't be flexible about that. You must be inflexible. Husband over wife, authority. You must be inflexible about that. If you get flexible, what happens? You about die like Moses did. Moses got flexible about the inflexible. He said, all right, all right, wife, I don't want to argue with you anymore. You do with that child what you want, and that's not how you do it. You don't push it over on your wife. You are the authority and you become inflexible and you cut it off. That is the foreskin, Moses. But he got flexible and he almost died. And when you get flexible about the inflexible, you're treading on thin ice. But when you get inflexible about the flexible, you're treading on thin ice because then you're going to live your life in sin and in squabbles. I mean, you're not going to be flexible enough to have a good relationship with anybody. Flexibility is relaxation about everything except, well, you're relaxed about the Word. You just know what you're going to do. But when it comes here, you're relaxed as well. Flexible. Flexible. Anyway, we studied that yesterday. I think the Colonel even did a series on that because of its importance. But that goes for the cosmic system as well because if you become flexible regarding doctrine, you'll fall into the cosmic system immediately. So how do we have to do it? We have to have the correct motivation and that means to be inflexible toward doctrine. That means to get it all the time as much as you can, really. One hour a day I would say it's sufficient, but really as much as you can. As much as you organize yourself around doctrine, the more the better. Some people say, oh, one person told me, some idiot in Baraka Church told me this. I walked in, and he said, yeah, you know, though, you can get too much doctrine, get too focused on it. No, you can't! You're an idiot! We have what is called, it's called a uh, ever-expanding, um, what those things in the ancient world, wine, um, they were ever-expanding wineskins, that's right ever-expanding wineskin that you can pour as much doctrine into it as you want and it will not bust. You can never get enough doctrine. You can listen 16 hours a day and people might think of you as freaky, but you can never get enough doctrine. Never! That's stupid. So, doctrine on the one hand is a motivation, motivated by what you know and what you don't know. And love. On the other hand, your love for God is a motivation to get to know Him. As a result, maximum glorification of God and occupation with Christ. You know, people who say you get too much doctrine or that you can get too much doctrine, they're just lazy. They're not getting it themselves. They feel guilty. So then they try to push it off as you being the weirdo. No, they're the weirdo. They're the ones without the proper motivation. So now let's look at simultaneous advance to the greatest oxymoron of history. Now that's what will fix the country, proper motivation, correct motivation. This is what's destroying to cut the country. On the one hand, you have Matayotes at the bottom. That's the vacuum. You've rejected or neglected doctrine. As a result, Matayotes is opened up in your stream of consciousness. 
And now you suck in the doctrine of demons on the knowledge side. Why do you do it though? Because on the other side you have a love for the cosmic system. You love it! You crave it! And that's your motivation. I've given you verses in the past on that. As a result, you'll have a tactical loss. You'll lose your escrow blessings for time. Meaning you're going to live a miserable life. You're going to have no capacity for life. You could have a billion dollars, no capacity for life, and be miserable. You could have a billion dollars, have a yacht, a mansion. You could go fishing whenever you wish, go flying whenever you wish. Go from here to there whenever you wish. Go to Hawaii. Say, all of a sudden tonight, you might uh, be kind of uh, restless, and you say, hey, let's go to Hawaii. Let me call up my pilot, and we'll be off to Hawaii. And all of us sit here and say, man, that would be fun, wouldn't it? It would be fun for a while. Then it's just the same old routine. And you become unhappy. Why? Loss of escrow blessings for time. Now, if you have capacity for it, it's a whole different story. But most people who have capacity for it never get to do that because maybe it'll become a distraction. But you have loss of escrow blessing for time. An escrow blessing deals with that which is above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. It doesn't deal with material blessings. You could be in Pleroma and be poor as dirt but be happier than the billionaire. Way happier. Because you are a billionaire, it's just invisible. Now the strategic loss comes from loss of escrow blessings in eternity. Now you've moved on into the eternal phase. You're going to have maximum shame in a resurrection body because you've had loss of escrow blessings for eternity. You in your lifetime might have flown from here to Hawaii 15 times and thought that was great. You may have been all over the world and bragged about it. But that's just a short time on the earth. Wait till you get into heaven that lasts in eternity and you've lost all the escrow blessings. You're not going to have any. And it would be sad, except you made the choice. Therefore, it's not sad. You made the choice. You said no to doctrine and yes to something else. So loss of escrow blessing for eternity. Therefore, there will be shame in your resurrection body. You will be occupied with yourself, and when you go through the dying phase of life, if it lasts long enough, you will have a personal sense of failure. You'll know you failed. Some people die instantly and they uh, immediately go to be face to face with the Lord and they will re receive their shame at the resurrection. Most people don't die instantly, however. Most of us uh, die from a disease or something else. Heart disease, I think, for elderly people is the biggest. Cancer, the second biggest. And those are more slowly, oftentimes slowly, unless you have a heart attack, that can go very quickly. But either way, you'll know when you're dying, I didn't do it, I didn't execute my spiritual life. You might know it, you won't, will not know it in those terms, but you know you failed. And you'll have a personal sense of failure. What a shame. So what will fix this, mo this nation again? We must have correct motivation among believers. And that deals with the double column advance. You're motivated by what you don't know about doctrine and by what you do know about doctrine. You're motivated by love for God. And therefore you must uh, continue to do this. Second Chronicles 7.14 Turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles 7.14 Second Chronicles 7 14. This is what will fix this nation. But this is something that hasn't occurred. If my people... Now, of course, in Second Chronicles, it's dealing with the Israelites, client nation Israel. But today, it's dealing with client nation USA. It has application... Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people today would be uh, believers in Christ in this client nation who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Will humble themselves. I've told you before that the first act of humility 
after you've believed in Christ, that's your first act of humility as an unbeliever. You believe in Christ. Your first act of humility as a believer is what? Rebound. You name your sin to God. So when it says, if they will humble themselves and pray, it's a reference to rebound. They're humbling themselves. And how can I say that's rebound? You look at that and say, I see no reference to 1 John 1, 9 there. Oh, there's a reference to it. You just got to open your eyes a bit. We'll humble yourselves. The first act of humility, rebound. Look at this. If you do not humble yourself, what do you do? You should know all this by now. If you do not rebound, self-justification, self-deception, self-absorption. And this is what the people of Israel were doing at that time, and this is what the people of the United States are doing today. Believers, instead of naming their sins to God, I am right. I was justified in what I said. Can't tell them any differently. Self-deception and self-absorption. And that is what the believers in the United States are going through. So what happens when you humble yourself? This is what happens. You break from this system. Humble yourselves. You break from this system and you simply use 1 John 1 9. You name your sins to God. And when you name your sins to God, what are you doing? You're admitting you're wrong for the first time. For the first time, you're not justifying yourself. For the first time, you're not deceiving yourself. For the first time, you're not self absorbed. For the first time, you look in the mirror and say, I was wrong. And name it to God and to no one else. You simply say, I was wrong and name it to God. If you've done someone else wrong, don't bother. Just name it to God. If you want to apologize, that's your business. If you're still, uh, if you're married, definitely apologize. If you uh, have to work with that person, it might be wise to apologize. But guess what? When you name it to God, it's forgiven whether you apologize or not. It might be wise to. Plain old common sense just to break the ice. So you know I was wrong about that. Sorry. Some people won't accept apologies though. Sometimes it's best just to forget it. Depends on the situation. But this is what it means when it says, humble yourselves and pray. Rebound. And seek my face. Well, after you rebound, there's always a follow through. See, how do you seek God's face? Learn doctrine. Rebound, learn doctrine, and turn from their wicked ways. That means you name it and disregard it. it. means you've had a change of mind, really. When you've turned from your wicked ways, you've named it and you've disregarded it. You see, now you're learning doctrine. As a result, you're going to turn from those wicked ways. So there is a follow-through to rebound. Name your sin to God. You disregard it and you forget it. You learn doctrine. That's the protocol. And here it says rebound and seek my face, learn doctrine, and turn from your wicked ways. It all goes together. It's all part of the rebound technique that, that we, that's that been taught here before many times. Then, then, will I hear from heaven. Then will I hear from heaven. Some people think that they can pray out of fellowship and God hears them. No, they don't. No, God doesn't. When will God hear your prayers? When you rebound. When you name it and when you disregard it. And you become a more effective prayer warrior when you seek His face through doctrine. Then will I hear from heaven. Not before then, but then. Will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will restore corrected translation restore their land so what will solve the problems of this nation rebound a spiritual revival among believers you see this uh, second chronicles 7:14 is talking about believers most people will stand up and say you know what the only way this nation is going to be saved is if we have a great revival for unbelievers is what they mean for people who haven't believed. But this nation is filled with believers. If that were the case, we wouldn't have any problems. 
If all we needed were believers in this nation, we wouldn't have any problems. Just imagine all the believers in this country. If all it took was a believer to turn the country around, we wouldn't have one single problem. What we need to ask ourselves is, with all these believers in this country, with all the believers in Anderson, why is it so poverty stricken? And it is compared to the rest of the country. With all the believers in Anderson, why is it poverty stricken compared to the rest of the country? Because they don't know rebound. They are not humble. They do not seek his face through doctrine. For up to believers, this right here would be the most prosperous place in the world if that's all it had to be was a believer. But it's not. Their prosperity, I guess one of the most prosperous places in the world is Houston. In terms of big cities, it definitely is. The most prosperous place in the world. Humid as hell, but prosperous. I wonder if hell's going to be a dry heat or a humid heat. <laughs> It's going to be a humid heat because when you go to uh, the uh, desert, they say, oh, it ain't that bad. It's a dry heat. It's going to be a trillion degrees with 100% humidity in hell. There you go. Anyway, it's going to be painful, but we don't need to worry about that. So that's what's wrong with this nation is believers themselves. Believers themselves who do not know rebound, who do not know 1 John 1, 9, who don't know what it means to be humble no matter how much you teach it. Who don't know what it means to be humble, who don't know how to rebound, who don't know how to seek the face of God through consistent learning of Bible doctrine, which means daily. And they don't know how to turn from their formerly wicked ways. They can't break their Jerry Springer syndrome. So they're stuck. And they're making our country stuck in a rut. Well, let's get back to our study of Satan a bit. Satan actually has three falls, two of which are in the future, one of which has already occurred. Satan has three falls. Number one, his first angelic sin of arrogance in which he said, I will be like the Most High God. When he did that, he revolted against God. He took a third of the angels with him, as per Isaiah 14, 13 through 14, and Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19. We won't go over these because we've been over some of these verses before. But his first fall was when he revolted against God in rebellion. Pride is what we would call it. But anyone involved in rebellion is full of pride. They don't understand authority. And he said, I will be like the Most High God. That's when he revolted against God. And he took a third of the angels with him. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19. That was his first fall. His second fall will be when he is cast out of heaven in the tribulation. Actually, he will be cast out of heaven in the middle of the tribulation. This is where a lot of people get confused on uh, pre-tribulational, post-tribulational, etc. But they shouldn't. Uh, it's just talking about Satan. He is cast out of heaven in the middle of the tribulation. You see what most people say is, you see there, we're going to be here to the middle of the tribulation because then Satan will be cast out of heaven. So they're looking for signs and wonders now. Remember, the tribulation is an age of Israel. It's not an age for the church. It continues the age of Israel. It's Daniel's 70th week. And the church, Daniel, part of the age of Israel, and as the church age, we're completely separate from Israel. We have nothing to do with that part, the tribulation. Nothing no signs and wonders for us if anything there are no signs and wonders but if anything the uh, resurrection would occur during a time of peace because the first three and a half years of the tribulation will be the greatest peace movement in all of history not necessarily it might happen during a time of war and then Satan tries to make peace but either way the first three and a half years of the tribulation is the greatest peace movement in history not war. And everybody looks at the war in the Middle East and says, Oh, it's coming. Have you, don't you know the first three and a half years of the tribulation is peace? Peace? When there is no peace? And Satan will be running around, Peace? Peace? When there is no peace? There is no sign for us. 
and people who want to make signs out of it are completely ignorant. Now, he is cast out in the middle of the tribulation. That's found in Revelation 12.7, Revelation 12.9, and Revelation 12.20. Revelation 12.7, Revelation 12.9, and Revelation 12.20. He'll be cast out in the middle of the tribulation. And when he is cast out of heaven, Satan throws the biggest temper tantrum in world history. And then the violence begins. I really hope Satan ain't around here. <laughs> He's not. But I'm just saying. I guess when the colonel taught it and he had to say these things, Satan's sitting there probably listening, gnashing his teeth. What do you mean I'm going to throw a temper tantrum? I'll throw you it. I'll show you a temper tantrum. He is cast out of heaven in the middle of the tribulation and then throws a temper tantrum in which violence occurs. That is the second of his falls. The third fall is this. He is cast into the lake of fire. Isaiah chapter 14 describes it. Ezekiel 28 describes it. Revelation 12.20 describes it. He is cast into the lake of fire. That's his third fall. Isaiah 14 describes this. Ezekiel 28 and Revelation chapter 12. Also, actually I said Revelation 12.20, that's wrong. It's actually Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 20. So Satan has these three falls. Now next, he has two advents. Our Lord Jesus Christ has two advents, by the way. The, when he comes for us in resurrection, that is not an advent. People get that confused. The second advent is not the resurrection. Why? Because he doesn't touch the earth. An advent means you come to the earth and touch it with your feet. You're on the ground. The, the second advent is not the resurrection because he's not going to touch his feet on the ground. He's going to be in the air. And we will be there to meet him or we will go in the air to meet him. So that is not an advent that is simply the resurrection. So Jesus Christ has two advents and Satan has two advents. His first advent was in the Garden of Eden, which we just noted. The first advent of Satan was in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. And then he stays here, by the way. He doesn't leave. In Genesis chapter 3, he made his advent. Adam and Eve fell. He became ruler of the world and he's been that ever since and he stayed on the earth. Oh, he makes visits to heaven, but his domain is earth. This is his home now. And he made his first advent in Genesis chapter 3. His second advent will be at the end of the millennium. You see, Satan will be actually cast off the earth and for a thousand years be put into torments. But then at the end of the millennium, he'll be let out. So his second advent is at the end of the millennium in which he will start a revolt against perfect environment. That's called the Gog and Magog revolution. That's, second, that's Satan's second advent when he starts the Gog and Magog revolution. And you say, why did these advents, why did Jesus Christ, why does he have two advents, why does Satan have two advents? It's a courtroom case. And it's following protocol. Defense, prosecution. Defense, prosecution. One day, when I get an overhead, I'll show it to you that way. How it starts off with defense and prosecution. Defense and prosecution. Closing argument. Satan's closing argument, Gog and Magog. Jesus Christ, closing argument, they all go to hell. All of them. All unbelievers, all fallen angels, and Satan himself. So those are the two advents of Satan. Satan is the central antagonist of the angelic conflict, of course. He has a great organizational genius and he organizes demon armies. Not only does he organize demon armies, but he even organizes believers under demon influence. Why do people who learn doctrine come under so much attack? Because Satan is such an organizational genius and has such influence that uh, he even knows how to take uh, believers who become agents of Satan and use them. And the reason why he has to be such an organizational genius has to do with the fact that he's not omnipresent. 
Satan can only be at one place at one time, therefore he needs a network. Like an internet. Satan invented the internet, not Al Gore. Mm -hmm. And he has his own internet, as it were. And it goes uh, all across the world. And he uses agents, different servers, I guess you would call it. I don't know much about computers, but I know there's a server. I guess he would be the main, the main server. And what do you call it? The main... I'm sure you know, you took computer science. The mainframe. We'll say Satan's the mainframe, and then from that he has his servers everywhere. And so from the mainframe goes all the servers. Maybe we'll need to make little sheets on that one someday. But he is the mainframe, and he knows mo more than all the other angels. Of course, he's a super genius, but he is still not omnipresent. And he can't do this all on his own. So he uses agents, fallen angels, unbelievers, and believers in the cosmic system. So he's an organiza organizational genius. And he makes attacks on the human race. There are four major demon attacks he's made on the human race. Let's get them down. First of all, well, he's actually made uh, more attacks on the human race than this, but I'll give you these. Actually, let's have five of them. This one was left out for some reason. I don't know why. The first major attack was on marriage. Satan's first major attack was on marriage. And he succeeded. His second major attack was the anti-Diluvian uh, civilization in Genesis 6. The first one, by the way, is found in Genesis 3. The second attack is the genetic attack in which he tried to corrupt the human race by having fallen angels. Actually, these are the body demons, the lowest ranking of the angels. They are the body demons. They had bodies. Now, visible bodies to the human race. Now, most angels, actually all angels today, are invisible. And the lowest ranking of the satanic followers were bodied. Uh, apparently, all the body demons went for Satan. They were the stupidest anyway. Apparently they did, but uh, they were there are there is a category of body demons they are in Tartarus today. But they they made a genetic attack on the antediluvian civilization in Genesis 6. And when they did so, they almost corrupted the entire line of Christ. But what stopped it? One marriage. Noah, well actually more than one marriage. Four marriages. Noah was married to his wife and then his children were married to their wives. Noah and his family and that was it. Four marriages saved the human race. And then of course God dealt with the antediluvian civilization and when he did so he said you body demons are out of order. In other words in contempt of court. You infiltrated the courtroom. And they were wrong in doing so. So today, they are in a compartment of Hades. Then we have the number three, the attack of demon possession. That's for unbelievers only. No believer can be demon possessed. That's obvious. The attack of demon possession for unbelievers only. Number four, the attack of demon influence. That can be for believers or unbelievers. Either one. For the unbeliever, when they go under demon influence, they reject divine establishment. For the believer, they reject doctrine and they even may reject divine establishment. One or the other. Usually both. They're under demon influence. The fifth attack is the attack of the demon armies and that occurs in the tribulation. That's found in Revelation chapter 9. And you better thank God we won't be here for the tribulation. This is when the body demons, which have been now hidden from us in the center of the earth for thousands of years, they will come out in the tribulation. And their whole purpose, you see they're psychotic, 
Their whole purpose is to torment people. Their whole purpose in Genesis chapter 6 was to have sex with the ladies, which they did. It also became a violent time, which indicates their great violence. But in the tribulation, their whole purpose will not be sex. Their whole purpose will be torture. And they will torture human beings, unbelievers. And they will be tortured to the point that they will want to commit suicide, but God won't allow them to commit suicide. Why? He's bringing them all the way. He's hardening their hearts, as it were. He's giving them every chance possible to believe. And they're going to not believe. They're going to, be, they're going to go so far as to be tortured by demons and not believe. They're going to see miracles and not believe. They're going to see miracles and counter miracles from Satan and not believe. They're going to be tortured by demons and not believe. They're going to try to shoot themselves in the head and not be successful and still not believe. That shows how far hardness of heart can go. And that's actually part of God's grace just to show in the appeal trial, look, they wouldn't even believe after this. It shuts up all the arguments where people say, well, if God would just show himself to me, if he would just show me a miracle, if he would just do this or that, I would believe. No, you would not. You would be just like the people in the tribulation, trying to blow your head off and still rejecting him. And this is what God will prove in the tribulation. We'll be in heaven getting evaluated, which might be a tribulation for some. A mini tribulation anyway. So Satan is the or or origin of murder. We noted that. Let's go back to the... Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, composites of Satan. And the composites of Satan obviously tell us that he is the originator of murder. He's the originator of violence. And he originated it in the human race. Genesis chapter 6 talks about all the violence that went throughout the earth. That's because all the body demons were in control and they had half human, half demon people and violence spread throughout the earth. And Satan, by the way, doesn't play by any rules. You know what that means? Hezbollah does not play by any rules. Oh, they may stop for a day or two. Next thing you know, there'll be a rocket headed toward Israel, armed with a nuclear bomb. He doesn't play by rules. All this UN stuff, well, that's part of Satan's plan. He's, he's a tricker. He's a deceit, deceitful. He uses the UN as his great uh, deceitful arm. And it's in where? New York City. We need to get the hell out of the UN and get the UN the hell out of the US. We're a client nation. We don't need that junk. And it's a satanic organization. Deceptive, too. And the whole world's against Israel. And because the whole world was against Israel, we started out gung-ho. You go, Israel. You kill the terrorists. But because the whole world turned against Israel, we had to go along with the world, didn't we? How foolish. How stupid. How naive. That's as naive as Jimmy Carter. Stupid. And there's deception. And there's violence that he holds to. And the reason why there's violence all over the earth today even, Satan doesn't play by any rules. We follow some stupid thing called the Geneva Convention. Satan doesn't follow that. Also, he is the enemy of Bible doctrine. Satan is the enemy of Bible doctrine. As the enemy of Bible doctrine, he attacks your capacity for life as a believer. He is the enemy of Bible doctrine, and he attacks your capacity for life. You know why? Because of his counterfeit. What is his counterfeit? His counterfeit is money will make you happy. His counterfeit is sex will make you happy. You know, the frantic search for happiness. His counterfeit is, well, whatever you want to do will make you happy. Pleasure will make you happy. Drug abuse will make you happy. Alcohol abuse will make you happy. This and that will make you happy. No, it won't. Oh, it'll stimulate you for a moment. But then you, you'll crash at some point. So... He attacks your capacity for life, and how does he do that? By attacking Bible doctrine. And so instead of you thinking that Bible doctrine is the source of your happiness, 
you start to buy into the fact that money or whatever, whatever is on your list of details. One day I'm just going to have to uh, list down all the details of life and go through all of them so that it won't miss one of you. It's going to hit somebody. Well, uh, uh, social life. People think social life will make them happy. Wrong. So it attacks Bible doctrine and says, nah, that won't make you happy. This will. It attacks your capacity for life. He's the enemy of the church, number three. He's the enemy of the royal family of God. That's found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 through 13. He is the enemy of the church, the royal family of God. Revelation 2, 9 through 13. He is the enemy of Christ. That's simple enough to understand. I won't give you a verse because it's all through the Bible. He is the enemy of Christ. He is, no, that's number four. Number five. He is called the anointed cherub. The anointed cherub. As such, he held the highest ranking position of all angelic creatures. As the anointed cherub, Satan held the highest position of all the angelic creatures. Did power make Satan happy? No! Will power make a presidential candidate happy? No! Won't make us happy either. Powerless people hope they stay away or get defeated. As such, he did hold the highest ranking position of all angelic creatures. But now, now he is lower than the seraphim. The seraphim are those who are in command of the elect angels. When he revolted against God, he was demoted. When he revolted against authority, he was demoted. When you revolt against authority, whatever kind it is, from teacher to pastor to coach to military sergeant to whatever, husband, women don't like to hear that one, when you revolt against your husband, God just might demote you. Look, he was demoted. As soon as he revolted, he was demoted. And now he's lower than the seraphim. And seraphim is spelled S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. The seraphim. S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M. And they are in command of the elect angels today. Satan was in command of the elect angels. Satan used to be part of the elect angels. Not anymore. The highest ranking angels are those in command of the elect angels called the seraphim. Number six. He is the greatest deceiver in history which we've studied, which we've studied from the composites of Satan. And uh, the best verse for that one as him being a deceiver is John 8. 44. And actually it describes his deceit and his violence. Turn to John 8, 44. We've read it, but I want to show it to you again. He's the greatest deceiver of history. And to be such a deceiver, the devil, or Satan, must be the most effective and the greatest. The greatest and most effective liar in his history. Satan is the greatest and most effective liar in human history. If you find someone who seems to be a compulsive liar, run the other way. Please. Because Satan is the most effective liar in all of human history. And when you see politicians who are very good at lying, they've fallen into Satan's system. Now, I believe George Bush is an honest man. There's just times when uh, all of us can be naive at points. We must pray for our president because he's under pressures we do not understand. I believe if I were under some of those pressures, I would have snapped. And I'm being serious. I would have snapped on the media. And then guess what? They'd have made fun of me from then on. That would have been it. That would have been the end of my presidency. you got to be presidential. You can't snap like that. I'm sure he's felt like it from time to time. 
and he's under all this pressure and there's people telling him to do this and that and the other. I think sometimes a president just needs to go away from his advisors for a while, sit down and think about it himself, make his own decision. There was a time in American history when presidents didn't have advisors. Well, if you're the president, what do you need one for? But it's okay to get the good information from somebody, etc. But when you uh, leave it to your advisors, you're going to get screwed up. John 8, 44. Pray for our president, by the way. John 8, 44, and our troops. You are of your father, the devil. This is our Lord speaking to who? Self-righteous unbelievers. You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. There are believer, believers who want to, the, the, to do the desires of the devil. But that's because they're under his influence. He was a murderer from the beginning. Meaning violent. He was a murderer from the beginning. Full of violence. Any man who beats on his wife, I want to beat on him. He thinks he's so tough. He who was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand for the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, from his own nature he speaks. That means every time Satan opens his mouth, it's a lie. We can say that about certain politicians. Every time they have or have had opened their mouth, what comes out? A lie. Every time Satan opens his mouth, a lie. Whenever he speaks, a lie. From his own nature, he speaks. Because he is a liar. And the father of lies. So you see how believers even fall under the same composites. And when you do so, you're following Satan. And you're in his system. How can a believer be under Satan's system? Well, just do these things. Never rebound and become a liar. Become violent. Become deceptive. Become self-righteous. Become a legalist. If you're a legalist, you are following Satan. Period. I can't say a legalist who has believed in Christ is just like the father, their father. I was corrected on that and that was true. They can't be, a, it, it, their, it, the father, their father is God the father, even though, but you can say of them they're in the cosmic system. And you can say of them like Paul did, even weeping, they are the enemies of the cross. I guess that's the best way to put it. As Paul put it, it's their, their father is not the devil, but they are enemies of the cross. Believers, enemies of the cross. And self-righteous believers, your family members who are self-righteous, enemies of the cross. Who wants to hang out with an enemy of the cross? In fact, we're given commands all through the Bible not to even mess. Why? They're an enemy. And if they're an enemy of Jesus Christ, don't you think that they're an enemy of those who learn his doctrines? Yes. So if they hate Christ, they're going to hate you. If you're growing in grace and in knowledge, there's no way around it. And that's the way it's just going to be. That's because Jesus Christ has set a sword down between those believers who love doctrine and those believers who are indifferent toward doctrine or hate it. There are some believers who are just plain indifferent to it. They just don't have time for it. And there are some believers who are just plain hate it. Either way, they're in the cosmic system. One is in cosmic one, the other is in cosmic two. The one that neglects the word long enough will go into cosmic two. We've studied that before. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to who Satan is and what his system involves so as we can avoid it through rebound and keep moving. And so we can learn these things of doctrine and have the right motivation and that is a reciprocal love for you. And we ask these things in the name of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.